Meanwhile, Massimo has been investigating the other source of the saint's popularity, his miraculous blood. He has unearthed a 14th century history of Naples. According to the Chronicle, the liquefying miracle first occurred in 1389. But significantly, it's also the first time the saint's blood gets a specific mention. The blood of St. John was, which was in a pula, which was in a vial, first mention of the vial, and uh, liquefied as if it was coming out of his body that day. But wait a minute, you say this is dated 1389? Now, our saint died 305 AD, that's about a thousand years later. A thousand years of silence. Exactly. First mention after a thousand years. This specialism. Maybe. Well, you know, maybe nothing happened for all that time, uh, but this raises another question. Why did it take so long to start performing this strange transformation? Do you have the answer? I have to look at the wider context, because uh, it was a time when relics abounded in Europe, and uh, there are other relics of blood around here. Is there more blood in Naples? Oh yeah, plenty. And I want to see there's a pattern linking all these blood relics uh, together. Also, I'm interested in finding out the psychology of why there's this fascination with all this blood around here. Massimo has discovered that in the 1950s a survey was made of the city's relics. Incredibly, 191 bottles of blood were found hidden inside the churches and monasteries of Naples. More surprising still, seven of them were also said to perform a liquefying miracle. In search of a reason for this fascination with miraculous blood in the area, Massimo is arriving at one of the city's strangest churches. Until recently, it was home to a vast number of bones, the bodily remains of the unwanted, the unknown, and the unburied. He's been invited here by author Kamine Maturo, who believes the cavernous underground crypt holds vital clues. Kamine has conducted researches into the many blood relics stored in the city, and has a theory to explain the local obsession with liquefying miracles. He believes the key lies in an arcane cult of the dead, embedded in the city's culture, and a powerful need to believe in life after death. You see, in Naples and other places too, blood, when it's liquid, it represents life. When it's solid, it's death. There is a reason. Come with me. Massimo, here we are under Via Tribunali in the ancient center of the city, very close to the site of a temple dedicated to Diana 2,500 years ago. And we are underneath the church of the Souls of Purgatory. People have come here since 1,600 to pray for the dead, for those who don't have relatives, those who have been abandoned, those who have no name. These dead people appear in the dreams of Neapolitans. Neapolitans recognize them, come here, or came here, because since 1969 it's been forbidden. They took them away, they adopted them. Look at Degas Massimo. This is a scarabattolo, and it was built a whole dead person who had appeared in someone's dream. They put the skull inside the glass cabinet, and they pushed a white handkerchief. The soul of a dead person would get clean and it would go towards heaven, and everything in the life of the person who cleaned it would start to get better and better. This is also the theme of the blood. You pray so that the dead person can go to heaven. You pray so that the blood can come alive. Therefore, here in Naples, there is always this battle between life and death.